Welcome to the Mike Unmuch Podcast. I am your host, Mike Veerman, and I am here with my friend and trusted producer, Max Kerman. Max, what's going on? I'm feeling pretty good. I uh, I don't know how my voice sounds today, but uh, I did something uh, sort of unusual. Well, it's not unusual, but the first, second time I've ever done it, I had a singing lesson. You're a, a an acclaimed award-winning singer already, but you're still taking lessons because you can always... Improve. Well, I've never had lessons. This is my second lesson in two weeks in my whole life. Uh, and uh, How do you find them? Uh, they're very interesting. I, I've I've always wanted to because uh, I figured it would be a good way to conserve my voice. You know, you hear about Adele getting having to have vocal surgery. Yeah. Same thing with John Mayer. Didn't want to go through that. Uh, and then someone in Hamilton who I who knows a lot about music uh, suggested that I go check out this guy Tom because I was asking around. He lives six doors away from me, <laughs> so I was like, "How can I not do this?" It's meant to be it's serendipity. Yeah. yeah. And actually, he wasn't getting back to me. Uh, like, <laughs> I, I literally called him like five times. I uh, texted him. I emailed him. And he would not get back to me. And, I, and I'm like, God, come on. I'm <laughs> singing of the Arkells. This is Hamilton, Ontario. No. Uh, but uh, it was getting really frustrating. And I was getting, I wanted to be like, dude, you're losing this business. I'm going to go to somebody else. But you know when something's so convenient? Like the, the other next closest music teacher would probably be, I don't know, three blocks away. And that's just annoying enough for me not to do the, the singing lesson. So he, the fact he literally lived six houses away from me kept the business for him. His proximity overrode his tardiness. Totally. Well, Max, that's exciting. Yes. But there's other exciting things going on because this is being released on a Friday. Yeah. We're recording it a couple days before. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this Friday, this pod isn't the only thing being released because uh, you have a new video coming out for a song called private school off of your new album morning report yeah it's exciting man this is very exciting it's very exciting and you know as the producer of the show I'm, I'm just taking it as an opportunity to to plug my own stuff right <laughs> and, wait we're 27 episodes in and this is the first time it's true I, it's it's true I, I just haven't had a chance to really plug anything else. <laughs> but uh yeah no i figured you know let's let's open the show with just you asking questions to me about private school. Yeah. Well, this is exciting. Okay. So I've heard the song. I've seen the video. <laughs> we're also a little dry on material. So we're coming, <laughs> we're, we're recording this late, by the way. It's like 1130 uh, on Monday night. Yeah. And we just came uh, home from basketball. We, we played play a Monday night pickup league. And Mike was like, what are we going to talk about? I was like, we're going to talk about me, which is fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little late, but it's yeah. good. It's a good vibe for- Danica's sleeping upstairs right now. That's true. Yeah. Thanks, Danica. Um, so this song, what was the impetus for this song? How did you create this song? How did you write this song? Okay, so um, we, I, I'm always sort of thinking about uh, songs like as uh, other people's songs as references for things that, you know, Arkells ought to steal from from those bands. And um, I love Beck. And, there's, and Beck has like a whole catalog of like awesome dumb rock songs where he kind of like talks in them. And then <laughs> there's a hooky chorus. I was like, we need to do that. So... Um, yeah, and when we were recording uh, the song in the studio, like the instructions for everybody was like kind of play like a caveman. So Tim, who's a very good drummer who can like play in a lot of different styles, were like keep it really f-ing stupid. <laughs> uh, and Tony, who's like a virtuoso piano player, like he if you saw the part, well, I hope we have video footage of it. But he's sort of playing it like he's like a drunk guy at a bar. Actually, he kind of plays like the way you play in my house at 3 (laughs) a.m. on Saturday nights. Uh, But it suits the song really good. Um, And um, yeah, so and I really wanted to, I have like a note uh, in my phone where I just keep lyrical ideas. And most of the songs that have been written on the last couple of records are just like, are inspired by notes uh, that are on my phone. And a lot of those are just like expressions that I've heard like your brother says stuff sometimes, or you've said stuff. Actually, there's I think there's definitely stuff on the new record that you've said that I was like, oh, that's a really interesting thing. I wrote it down and it made the new record. No, oh. so um, so I think I had written something about private school on it, and uh, and for me, I really uh, yeah, private school is a real symbol of of status, and I was really I want to write something sort of tongue in cheek about you know, people that are born into a very good life, but don't really, aren't, aren't really aware of it. Right. They're not super self-aware. Yeah. So, and the lyrics sort of came together really quickly. Um, and a lot, it's funny cause like I'm kind of killing private school kids or like people of privilege who aren't aware of it in the song. Um, but I've, some of the inspiration comes from people that are actually quite nice that happen to live in that world, but just kind of have said things to me where I go, really? Like, I, cause I'm, cause I'm sort of, like what kind of things would they say? <laughs> so there's a friend of mine uh, who I really like. So I really like this person. Who's, she's a great person. 
does this thing where she's like, let's get a little bit naughty. <laughs> <laughs> like on a Friday night, when she's, right? She's about to party, and I, and, I, and I and I really like her. But there's something I was like, oh man, like these, like there are people with real problems here, and like the questions you're asking about, like where to find your drugs on a on a Friday <laughs> night, and like that's this kind of stuff that's stressing you out. I thought there was some some comedy in there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So so you write a song like this uh, when you when you bring a song like this to the band, what's their reaction? And they like it. I mean, uh, it was, uh, they're, the great thing about writing music with, with the guys is that I think um, we trust each other's instincts. So in this song, it's, as I said, pretty stupid, a lot dumber than a lot of other, uh, other music that we've made <laughs> together. And also, like, I'm kind of rapping in the verses, <laughs> like kind of spoken word, yeah. which is kind of uncharted territory for the Arkells. But to me, it was kind of exciting because it was just an opportunity to try something new. I'm also the chorus. I'm sort of singing in a slightly the lower register. Um, and, uh, and that was sort of like just kind of gives the whole thing a different complexion. But the guys were just like super excited. I feel like whenever we've done something that feels too much like our last record or another one of our songs, people are, have no interest in it, like it, within the band. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and which is kind of interesting because I think some Arkells fans might be inter- might be more interested in that. And sometimes we'll hear occasionally, like, "Oh, is this new stuff going to sound a little bit more like Jackson Square?" And I'm like, "Nope, like right. it's going to sound like this new record." Because and you already have Jackson Square if you want to listen to that. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, as a you know, an artist with a fan base, when you write, do you is it more about where you want to go personally, or do you ever feel like a need to service the fans that have been there? Uh, or is it your journey and it's like they can come along or they don't? Uh, I think I think we really always want to be aware and thankful for the people that are with us along, along the ride and that care about the band. And I and I like to think that there is a there's sort of in the Venn diagram of like wanting to chase every wild artistic dream and like what the Arkells fans kind of want from us. There's a lot of space in the mi- middle there where everybody wins. And and like for instance, like I think. When people, people I think are fans of our band because we write like fun, meaningful rock and roll music. Um, but that, that description mean, can mean a lot of different things. So for the, this is like a fun song. It's not like, I think there's funny moments in it, which I'm happy about. I think I, I definitely, when I was writing, writing the song, I was like, didn't want to write something that was too self-serious because I think there's enough self-serious white guy indie rock out there. I kind of want to have a bit of a sense of humor with it. Um, and so I was like, is the song going to feel good to play live? Are bros maybe going to take their shirts off and pump their fists, which I was kind of excited about. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, and, and do the lyrics mean something to me? And is there something sort of idiosyncratic in an RKLZ kind of way that, that will remind them of other songs on mm-hmm. our, our catalog? Um, just sort of in the way I write lyrics, do, do you check all those boxes? And I think we do in this song. So, and I think we do on the whole new record. So anyway, that all said, who knows? This, this, we're kind of in this very pure stage uh, of the creative process where the only thing we really know about the songs or the way we feel about the songs is how we feel about the songs. It's not based on what the fans love or what a mean thing somebody said on Twitter or whatever. It's like really still internal. It's it's still internal. And that's the purest way to feel about something you've created. Mm -hmm. As soon as it goes out there in the world, your, your perspective on what you've done changes because other people's view or opinion of the song is going to shift maybe the way that you end up seeing the song ultimately. Exactly. And you know, like for instance, like I, I'd be lying if I, said that Leather Jacket wasn't a really important song to me now because it, cause it turned into one of our big, or probably our biggest song. And I'm really grateful for that. And I see the connection people have with it. It shows. And that has all added up to me feeling really warm thoughts about that song. Whereas maybe another song on the last record, like What Are You Holding On To? That was probably my favorite song on the last record. But not that many people, like nobody would point to that song as their favorite song on the, on the, on the record on High Noon. And so, and I'm kind of like, yeah, I like that song, but it, do, it didn't have, do, it hasn't gone on the same journey with me as like a song like Leather Jacket. Which you were maybe not indifferent to, but- No, just, I liked it. It was but just it, another song it was just, the record. It was just another one of my babies, but maybe not my favorite. But, <laughs> so it's really interesting at in this point when, when you're about to put out new music, just to see like, who knows what people are going to sort of get attached to. 
So today, yeah, this pod has been released on a Friday, mm-hmm. but so is the music video yeah. for Private School. Sure. How'd the concept come about? Yeah, we um, we got a bunch of different treatments from different directors. And um, yeah, videos are hard because there's a lot of good, okay to good music videos. There's very few videos that are like truly great. Uh, and, what, and keeping that in mind, and because it's so easy to make a music video today, what we wanted to do is have a video that when you watched it made you like the song just as much or more. Cause I think we have some videos where maybe you don't makes you like the song less in a way because the visuals maybe are like too distracting or something like that. Hmm. I think there's some older videos of ours that like maybe do that. Um, so Steve-O from Sum 41 some 41 drummer of some 40 or f- former drummer of some 41. He, uh, he, he pitched a, a treatment. He's a music video director. Now. He's a music and he's done stuff with like Katy Perry and yeah. the three and all the some 41 stuff. I think he had his hand involved hand in. Um, and so it was very cool. Like Mike and I happened to be in LA and he was in LA, but we had like a conference call with him and it was just weird to be talking to Steve-O on the phone. And his like <laughs> kid was in the background making noise and stuff. Uh, and uh, we thought he had a great sense of humor and a really cool idea. And uh, we in, enlisted um, Lights to make a cameo. And she's the lighting person, so she makes a brief cameo in it. Former podcast. Former podcast. And also, another part of recording the song is that um, we recorded this one in L.A. We did the... I'll get into the rest of the record on another pod, but um, Dave Monks, who's an old friend of mine, who's the lead singer of Tokyo Police Club, he happened to be in LA and I said, Oh, Hey, we're recording some new stuff. Do you want to come on by the studio? And the way we did this record was a little slightly more off the cuff in a way than the last record, which I think keeps it really exciting. And Dave came by and I was like, Oh, this song might be perfect for you to sing because you kind of have a low register, get in the vocal booth, do some ad lib stuff and see what we got. And then he, and so if you listen to the song, knowing that Dave is on the track, he totally pops out in the choruses and <laughs> the Hey, Hey, Hey's like at the, in the post post chorus, um, are his idea, and that the, that's his voice. Well, all of our listeners for the Mike and Much podcast, who I'm guessing are Kels fans anyway, because I think that's mostly who comes to this <laughs> pod, um, check it out if you haven't already. All right, Maxi. Yeah. Today on the show, we have the Lumineers. Big get. Big get. Yeah. And one of my favorite interviews. Awesome I, interview. I really like talking to these guys. Yeah. And, um, you know, they, I'm sure, get hit up by everybody when they come through town. So uh, we're really lucky to have them on the show. And I remember talking to you, I'm trying to think where I was, because this interview happened when I was on tour. Yep. But I remember you called. And I, I always know the tone of your voice, <laughs> depend, like how the interview went. Uh, and you seem really excited about it. I just liked talking to them. They, they were really um, self-aware and introspective. And yeah, they were, uh, they were good guys. Um, so it was really exciting to get a, uh, yeah, some time with them. And it was just, we were in Greg Stewart's office, just yeah. hanging out. So I want to read a text message. So I know their publicist, Christina Fernandez. Shout out to Christina Fernandez. This is probably how we got the damn yeah, interview. She, she really went out uh, on a limb for us because there's a lot of options in that building at 299 Queen Street West. And they only probably did three shows. And yeah. we were one of them. So we're really yeah. lucky. So I sent her a text. She used to work with Arkells, amazing lady. Uh, and... I said, listening to the Lumineers interview, it's pretty amazing. Thanks so much, Christina. And she responds. She says, hey, sweetie, even cooler. Wes and Jer said it was their fave interview they did that day. And they did a lot. So uh, let me know when it gets posted. So anyway, I feel like when we get that kind of feedback, it makes our job all the more worthwhile. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. Should we just let people hear it? Let's get to it. Let's get to the Lumineers. How you guys been? Good. 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 Doing well. Press all today? Yeah, it's been good though. Yeah, it's been going well. Anyone asking the tough questions? <laughs> the people keeping it light? It's been pretty light. I don't know. Depends on. Sometimes the tough questions sounds innocuous, like, tell me about your album. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you should probably listen to it. <laughs> right. Stuff like that. Yeah. Um, well, I kind of want to start with Denver, because uh, you guys moved around a lot, obviously, mm-hmm. before you settled, um, and then you did settle in Denver. So I wanted to know, you know, why Denver initially? And then I wanted you to talk a bit about your relationship with the city and sort of describe what living and working there was like. Cool. Sure. Sounds interesting. <laughs> Let's do it. Is this mic all good? We're rolling, yeah. That's oh, how we cool. do it. Yeah. All right. So do you want to start from... He's the uh, engineer. That was very professional. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, did you, you want to start with a, like a specific question? or? Uh, yeah. I mean, specifically, why did you guys choose Denver when you were sort of looking to maybe settle as musicians? Because you guys have been playing for a really long time. And, yeah. Well, it's kind of like, uh, I think the best things in life 
never happened in according to plan. And so Denver wasn't really a plan so much as a friend said, hey, I'm moving to Denver and I can get a spot for you guys in a house where you could probably rehearse for half the price you're paying in New York. And I said, yes. And that was pretty much it, just saying yes to a, an invitation. Um, and then subletting my New York apartment and leaving town with Jer. So it was pretty, um, it was pretty my spur of the moment. All I knew was I wanted to leave New York. It's like, my buddy's an actor and he said, every great character is either running from something or towards something. And in that moment, I was definitely running from New York because I was so sort of devastated and by the fact that I was sold on this thing that wasn't really there anymore, which was like, you moved to New York to make it. When in fact, I moved to New York and played less music than I'd ever played because I had to work so hard just to make rent. Yeah. So um, I think it was just sort of like, we wanted to forge our own path, we just didn't know where. So if Denver didn't hadn't worked out, we would have gone to Omaha, we would have gone to Portland. It didn't really matter. And then once we got there, we met people like Stealth Olvang, who's um, our piano player now, but he was in another couple bands before that. And he would share all this great information with us, which allowed us to tour like the whole country. Uh, after meeting him, he, you know, I said, here's where you can crash. Here's where, here's where you can play a house the show. The how-to guide. He yeah, was he took us the, busking. Yeah. We had never busked. He took us out on the streets busking. And so that kind of community environment, um, it sort of welcomed us and it quickly became apparent that we wanted to stay in Denver because the vibe and the people were right. And it just, it just felt very natural. It wasn't like in New York, it was like, it was a little more standoffish and there. It was like, we're, we're so happy you came. What's sure. your name? You know? So diff, diff, just totally different vibe. Jeremiah, were you as burned out on sort of the mythology of New York as well? Yeah. I, I heeded to Wes's advice. I, I didn't think he was, I didn't feel like I was missing out on something like, Oh man, I really want to work five jobs and live in Brooklyn. Like I was like, all right, I totally believe you. Cause even when he was there, I was still in New Jersey finishing up school and we were trying to meet kind of in the middle in like Manhattan and these like crazy, just like noisy, uh, practice spaces. And it just felt we were being disconnected on a relationship musically. It was like, slowly dissolving before our eyes and i think wes was really great at being like well let's we need to move somewhere fast or this thing's not going to work anymore and that was really pivotal in, in making that decision to escape the east coast and go towards something else right um nathaniel rateliff is a big part of that denver scene yeah. um and it's kind of crazy because he sort of crossed over from that like npr like folk world to pop radio as well um, is there any reason or like sort of rhyme to this or why people are sort of coming out of this scene? I mean, do, do you guys feel like it's sort of like a, something about that Denver scene or do you think it's just coincidence and random? Well, when we first moved to Denver, um, he was already a really, you know, well-known entity, like a big, big deal in Denver and in a lot of other places, but like in that folk and NPR kind of scene, that's the type of music he was making. So, um... I think I think part of it was like he hung around long enough for people to find him. You know right. what I mean? You know, you, you hear those artists that you, you, you could say it's the record that really determined it, but I think he's been making really good records for a long time. Um, and it, I felt like, I think we shared that and the idea that, um, I remember hearing a history teacher, he said like, he described this, the war of attrition, you know, it's like, yeah. if you have three and I have two, you're eventually, I'm eventually going to lose to your forces just because it's, we're gonna take each other out. And it felt like music, the longer that you can continue to play music and make music, it's like you will outlast. And if you believe what you're doing is good, I think something will happen. It doesn't mean it will happen in a certain type of way, but I think you can, if you wanna play music for a living and you're not delusional about what you're doing, you can do it. It's mm -hmm. just more, if you're trying to get rich or something, it's the worst way to do it. <laughs> sure. It's the, it's the worst idea in the world, but if you just wanna play music and your terms are simple, and I think, we had stuck with it up until like, it took us eight years to get a break and for Nathaniel, probably a little longer, but I think at the end of the day, he was like, now he's, he's so ready for that moment. I felt like we were groomed also because we had failed so long yeah. <laughs> that we, we knew how to play live shows, knew how to deal with crowds that were indifferent, let's say at festivals or there things like that. And so all that comes to your advantage, but before that it all feels like you're an anonymous or you're disadvantaged, but it can be really great. You just have to hang on. And that's, that's the hardest part sometimes is just 
finding a place where you can yeah still make music because often people are like oh, i remember meeting a guy who worked at whole foods and he just literally quit music because the job paid too well yeah and i was like that's why i don't want, i don't want a job at whole foods like i don't want to i don't want to be tempted by a job that's good enough that yeah. you might be like cushy yeah. side job because that life looks all right right because yeah. you go hey like i could settle in and, and i think at different levels of music it's so unknowable and there's no yeah. sort of guarantee and you have future. a kid or something like Absolutely. who knows so we've always that, aspired to good can really get in the way of great if you have a good job <laughs> a good couch you get your good netflix and hulu good you're like it's good i mean what why would you change something that's good if you're in nothing to lose desperate desperado like desperate yeah. times we'll call like we'll call for desperate measures truly and i think that i felt like at times we were in this like kayak and then we saw these like leaks occurring and we're like just keep paddling it'll be fine <laughs> keep going but the leaks were like very th- real and you're just like going to sleep some nights like sometimes actually sweating like wow this is really this has got to break something's got to give at some point and we're lucky that something eventually did in a massive way but uh yeah like wes said the war of attrition is very true yeah, yeah. If you're good enough and you hang around long enough, people will find you. Yeah, yeah. Hope and, and it, you just can't say how many, but I think sure. people will. And like, I remember hearing that. Uh, I thought of that Dire Straits song where he's like, he says, "And Harry doesn't mind if he doesn't make the scene." Yeah. And then he says, "He's got a daytime job. He's doing it all. He's doing all right." And then he says something about saving it up for Friday nights. Like it's like, that song is so revealing of like Mark Knopfler spending time on the road, <laughs> and sort of saying like. There's a big difference between like you know actually flying your flag and seeing who salutes and just sort of like putting it up halfway. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And I felt like that's an example of like us. I hope and other people like Nathaniel and but there's towns like in in every town there's a band who just sticks with it and it's about commitment. Yeah. Yeah. And if if you can do that, it does like I I just can't stress enough. Some people are like we've been in all these different worlds and I think the purest world is like do you do it and do you get to do what you love. If you do that, then you're so ahead of the game. But there is this weird, you know, you have the, the capitalism coming into it where people are like really fascinated by what, what things do you moan and like how's your life that much different? It's like all we're pretty boring people personally. We just love writing music yeah. and playing music. And um, that's how I feel like lucky. So we're, we're bad fodder for like social yeah. media, but we're, I think we're good fodder for our albums. You know, we're sort of, we're just, we just love it. Um, I think I saw Joel Walsh from the Eagles. I don't know exactly who he was quoting, but he sort of mentioned that when you're living life, because you're talking about taking these chances, like saying, yes, we'll go to Denver or we would have gone somewhere else. He says, when you're in your life, it feels like sort of chaos and unknowable. And it's only once you get to the end where you look back and it looks like a finely crafted novel. Mm -hmm. Like everything makes sense. And it's like, we were supposed to be in Denver and we were supposed to do this and all that. And I think that's true of like sort of everybody's life. But I think it's bold to sort of take that choice. Mm. Um, I think people thought we were kind of stupid or crazy for thinking Denver would somehow be better for us musically than New, New York. York. But yeah. Even like, even like just being forced, if you're in the center of the country, you have to go to the West coast and the East coast. You can't just stay there. It kind of made us just like the idea of having a not great side job, but good enough to pay the bills. Yeah. Like you never really feel comfortable there. Like you can't just tour there. You have to move. You're, you're sort of forced against the wall to do it. So in that way, the Denver also made us, like shoot out east and west whereas we probably would have been like a yeah. west coast band or an east coast band if we just moved to one of those um as you guys sort of you know like you said you're doing everything you're doing open mic nights you're busking um and then all of a sudden you get bigger rooms as you guys sort of get on this massive trajectory what have you found sort of as, as performers like what worked in smaller rooms that doesn't work in big rooms and what works in big rooms that sort of would never work in a small room? Like, did you find yourself on a big stage kind of like being almost a little too small, like in your sort of delivery and your performance? Well, something on a smaller stage that works that doesn't work in a big stage is clapping. If you clap a small stage like this, like at your kind of your sternum for the podcast listeners at your chest level, small stage that works. If you're in a stadium and you're doing the chest level clapping, you have to really exaggerate stuff and put your hands over your head and if you think you're acting like a wild person you're probably acting just normal enough for it to translate well in a very big room if that makes sense yeah and uh does that take a while to get comfortable with though yeah i remember like super demonstrative and not feel insane weird yeah i think that that gave me a lot of stage fright because i think for me too in my in my grooming over the years i was always like this drummer and you can hide behind your crash cymbals and stuff and i think for west it's like that's he knows it's part of the deal to be the lead singer, front man. But for me, I was like, that's not, I'm not a front man, but I'm, 
just coming up to the front of stage for certain songs or instructing people to do help us out with certain songs that was or clapping in a different way it feels really uncomfortable almost agony at first the first couple times you do it but then when you see the results like oh that really worked or the crowd responded positively then you realize yeah keep doing that if it makes you scared you're probably on to something i think with, with regards to performance yeah i've noticed too like the banter if 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 a band hasn't played in yeah. front of like a large audience ever and then they start to the first thing that they tend to do is say a lot on the mic which it just doesn't work. Like you have to keep everything. It's like I heard Seinfeld saying about his jokes, you know, that, that the difference was, the difference between funny and not funny was like a, a syllable. It'd be like, instead of going, the, the syllables of a joke were like, da 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 it's gotta be da 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 And that's the difference. That's like the whole difference. And I've seen people who, like Bruce Springsteen, you, you know what he's saying, even if you can't quite, can't quite make out the words. Sure, you know what he wants from you. The rhythm of his voice. Yeah. No, 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 no. And, and you you're excited, and you know, he's kind of like good at like directing, basically. Uh, he's like a, he's like a, he'd make a good probably film director. You know, he just knows how to direct an audience. And, and I've had to learn some of that on the fly. If you want them to sort of cooperate or go in your direction, you, you can't be like, hey, we're uh, the Lumineers. Really have to be here. It has to be, you have to really like almost, you know, the sounds you make are as important as the words you're saying, you know? So it's like, that's a, that's been an interesting thing to, to learn on the fly and also like learn, watch guys do it and go, Oh, that's how he did. A that. lot of musicians yeah. go to move for some reason when they're nervous is comedy. And that doesn't really work at all <laughs> ever. It's like, for some reason they just go to comedy. I've seen a lot of lead singers do that in times of nervousness. Or, like self-deprecation or... Or, or like... Anecdotes. I, I remember one time in Portland, this, ba this band was like... It was around the holidays and this guy couldn't tune his guitar for the life of him. And he was like, anybody Jewish out here? Like, he oh, made some holiday joke. And I was like, oh, this is so painful to watch right now. And I think for us... We we know we're not funny. We pride ourselves on <laughs> pride says I'm not being funny. <laughs> yeah, and just really trying to let the music speak for itself. It's like why would you work so much in the music and then you're gonna try like open mic comedy routine? That I mean that this is a more of a rant now. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a political tirade. This is what we're gonna do next time on stage. Yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned Bruce as someone that's sort of great at that as a yeah. front man. I mean, is, is he someone that you sort of look to, or is there someone in general that you go, I like how they do it? Yeah, I think Bruce Springsteen, uh, I saw that, him and Tom Petty. How's Tom? Tom Petty, he, I think I almost understand him more because he's more like sort of subtle, but he has these really grand gestures and he welcomes you in. I remember seeing him play growing up in New Jersey at this amphitheater. I don't know what it's called now, but it was like PNC Bank Art Center at the time. Yeah, some bank. And, um, bank. It's a beautiful amphitheater, you know, outside in the summertime. And he played this show and I was like 16. And he played Last Dance with Mary Jane. And I just remember he walks over to this chest that's on stage for no good reason. And, you know, it's like he opens up. There's probably a light inside. So it's like, ah. <laughs> and he takes out this, you know, this really sweet hat and puts it on, starts singing the song. And then at the end of the song, opens the chest back up and puts it back in. And I was, it's like what I remember from the show. And I started thinking like, he made that, even though it wasn't, you know, something you, you really write home about, so to speak. It's what I took away. It's these non-musical acts that you add to the show, those little things that you add. Like if you had a dinner plate and you have a little decoration on the side that you're not supposed little to eat. garnish, yeah. It's like sometimes you remember that and the music's always really good and it's there, but it's those little actions. And so it was inspiring to be like, I don't, I'm not Eddie Van H or, you know, I'm not, um, you know, What's his name? Diamond Dave. Oh, David Lee Roth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to do backflips. That's not in me. That's not my personality. But, uh, like, I can identify with, like, adding something to the show in a way that invites people in. And you're trying. You're trying to, to do something. But, Bruce, I sat second to last row in Giant Stadium um, when I was a little older. And I was, it was raining, I think. Everything was against him. And it was, I felt like I was in a small room with him. It was unbelievable. Wow. Um, at one point he collapses and then they bring him back to life. <laughs> a little bit of James Brown yeah, action. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's like almost like a Baptist preacher um, at times. But most of it came down to the songs that the whole crowd was connecting with and had all these memories built into it, which even in just making one record, it was really cool to see. You could feel that there were memories attached to some of these songs by the reaction. Um, 
just starting to play the opening riff to a song or something. So for us, so it's it's been interesting and kind of inspiring to be like, well, we're part of some people's lives that way. And never, just never thought starting in a little, you know, room in your parents' third floor and Jerry's parents' third floor, um, that it would turn into this. It really, it's like, you know, a dream come true, you know, time many fold over. So yeah, it's extraordinary. Yeah. Mm. I mean, speaking of that, starting in a room and you guys, you know, playing cover songs, playing all sorts of music, I'd imagine not, you know, strictly folk or strictly rock or anything like that. I guess I'm always interested, you know, when any band, whether you're a rock band or a pop band or a sort of electronic band, um, when you guys are making Cleopatra, is there ever um, a desire to maybe stray from genre or try new things? Or do you guys, I mean, how do you guys do that sort of thing? Do you think like you owe it to sort of yourselves and the fans to make the kind of music you're making? Or do you guys kind of be like, you know, let's yeah. try something crazy? I think I'm, uh, I'm laughing a little bit at the question because there are times where I really rail against having to full commit to, to our specific sound. But I think what's important and really healthy is to keep the distinction of like, there's these things musically you have to get out of your system as like a hobby. And then there's like yeah. stuff that Wes and I commit 100% to with this band. So I think at times it's like, oh, I want to play loud drums. But I'm like, the song doesn't need loud drums. Sure. <laughs> so maybe run around the block or play loud drums, but <laughs> not with Wes. And then yeah, I think it's it's like 100% full commitment. I, I just saw this Chris Farley documentary last night and everybody said the same thing. They were like, this guy was full commitment. To a flaw, he really went to the dark side. Like, <laughs> yeah, we both saw it. It was, it was fantastic. Yeah. I, you know, I feel akin to that that sentiment, though. I, I think West does too. That like we, minus the drugs and alcohol, obviously, like the the full commitment of like the artist trying to do make a statement and go there to that place that takes a lot of like sacrifice and a lot of diligence. You know, I think who said Michelangelo said genius is infinite patience and I don't think we're geniuses by any stretch of the imagination but I do think we have a lot of patience with constantly trying to you know boil down our songs and then build them back up and I think with Cleopatra there was an excitement that sort of naturally these songs were evolving and being different not in a overtly strangling the material to the point where we're like let's make it different but a song like Ophelia um, a song like My Eyes and Patience, uh, Angela, these songs off the new record, they feel naturally different in a really exciting way where it's still so obvious, the Lumineers, but it's something brand new. Yeah, I think also it's like, it's been, it was odd for us on the first go around with, we had come from a lot of different music. We were playing really dissonant, you know, tons of pedals, electric sure. guitar, heavy drums, just very uh, dark sounding, you know, I think it was the aftermath of growing up on grunge and, yeah. you know, sort of being influenced by that and feeling like major chords were evil, <laughs> you know, because they taught us that minor chords mean the most. And then kind of unlearning that and just being attracted to something for what it was and not having baggage with it, trying to untrain our brains. Um, so even going to an acoustic guitar in the first one, it was, it was odd. I felt like we borrowed from different uh, you know we were called like folk let's say by people and i take that as a compliment if you're talking about like the storytelling aspect of folk music but folk music was about big things and important things and we were writing we're, we're writing songs like pop tunes like we're we, we're telling stories but we're not we're not trying to you know start movements in that way and so i have a reverence for folk that's like it's very odd to be lumped in like that's that's what you guys are. It's like, no, we're, we're, we're actually really interested in the craft of songwriting. Like that, those people had different ideas of what to do with music. So, um, in, you know, in, in this one going forward, it was like, I just felt like what there were mandolins that ended up on our first album and there's a violin or, or fiddle. And then there's acoustic guitar. These are like all folky kind of sounding things, but we weren't, I don't think that was like we were I feel like that would have been the tail wagging the dog like we weren't going to fit into a genre we were really just interested in borrowing from that to do something we felt was really interesting to us uh, so it's 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 obviously it's obviously like we have a we don't really like to be uh, like any band you don't want to necessarily type be pigeonholed cast. or typecast but in this next album we really tried to continue to embrace what we were interested in and not be like does this fit does this work you i think know, too like, i think we can try to use that that slight pigeonholing that i think it's occurred with the first album to as some leverage 
people think we're folk. All right, check out the second album. It's like it's it's not folk, but there are the stories. So it's sort of this. I don't know. It's I think it's I think what we're doing is really cool <laughs> right now with our music. It's it's constantly evolving and um, pushing the boundaries. I think. Are they wrapping us up? We got uh, about a minute and a half. All right. Well, I guess for my final question, <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess it's always interesting talking to artists, like any, whether you know you're acting or you're making music. Anyone that's sort of gone the long road around has been doing the job or you know the art for a very long time before they sort of have this sort of massive success. And you guys have had such massive success. How do you frame sort of the trajectory of your careers? I mean, do you guys? Like, how, how do you sort of, like, reckon it? Do you feel like it's just sort of, like, it's luck in the universe? Is it, like, is it hard work? And then a follow-up question, because, you know, anyone that makes it, it's like, have you guys met someone yet? Like, maybe it was an idol where you're like, holy shit, I can't believe I met, you know, Bruce or right. such a person. I think, I think I'm still working that out as far as how to reckon that. There's a bit of survival, survivor's guilt with it, you know, where you're sort of like, I've been doing this a while, and I feel really proud of what I do, but... Why me? You know, why us? Why now? But then the other side of it that you just kind of have to accept where you're at, whether it's good or bad. Uh, but I love that Joe Namath quote. He's like, I was just, I was right on time. And it's like, <laughs> I felt like we were just on time for whatever it was that was supposed to happen. It did happen. And uh, it, 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 I, I honestly didn't change all that much for the better or for the worse. It was just, it just made things really complicated at times. To, for us to get back to songwriting, it took three years for us to even be able to step back into that mode. That's not a great thing for us. We love writing music. So I kind of take the good with the bad and I say to people, that's why I think, you know, using us or Nathaniel or many other bands as an example, you, you have to outlast and just hope people get wise to it because they will. I can't say what level they'll get wise to it. We got some benefits just by our timing, but there's, it, you'll go crazy if you try to figure out why it is that you, why it is that you're exactly where you're at. Just like you'll go crazy trying to figure out how it is that you met your wife. Sure. <laughs> you know, it's like, were you supposed to be in that bar that night? Or were you supposed to meet that person who introduced you? I don't know. It's just life happens. And so, and then the, the second part of the answer is like meeting someone. The producer of our album is a member of the, was a member of the Felice brothers. His name is Simon Felice. And uh, he was sort of a, uh, someone that seemed untouchable, their band is like mentors and like sort of like these sort of folk heroes to us. These, um, they just made music that I felt like gave us permission to do the music on the, especially on the first record that we made. We felt like listen to their music. We love this. Well, they're not trying to dress it up. Why, why should we? And so they kind of challenged the idea that it had to be super produced. And, uh, he produced our last record, but just meeting him, befriending him and then, talking to him about the music we were making. It was just, it was a full circle moment that I think we saw him in 2007 in their hometown playing, you know, one of their big shows. And it was like, I cannot believe we ended up working with these people that really inspired us both live and on record um, to, to raise our game and to be, to make music that feeds people and nourishes them and not just, you know, is clever or something like that. So right. that was really cool to, yeah, for sure. Beyond beyond amazing to work with him. Yeah. Thanks for your time, guys. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. All right, welcome back. We are now in the part that Max likes to call the dessert. I am here with Max. Hello. And I'm here with Shane, our, our pop culture aficionado. Yo, Shane, yo. what's going on, man? Um, Nothing too much. It's just uh, I guess we got 10 days till our big bachelor party. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and Alex is here looking at me. Shane's fiance, Alex, is in the studio yeah. right now. So it's a little awkward because <laughs> she's never seen the magic. Like, she doesn't know that you edit all the bullshit I say down into a concise thing that makes sense. Yeah, yeah that, she that, that thinks I'm just like suit. spitting gold. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm kind of right now very nervous about the bachelor party because, as you know, you and I planned on getting ripped. For <laughs> Max laughs because Max is very skinny for this oh, special you're party. Talking about, like think, in shape, you meant ripped, like getting drunk. Okay. No, that's a given, Max. Okay. But in, in good shape. Oh, yeah, yeah, like yeah. everyone kind of had a like 
when you're about to go somewhere tropical to a bachelor party, it's yeah. like, oh, let's get in shape because everybody wants to look good. And the thing is, we're kind of extending this uh, bachelor trip to people outside of the Champagne Boys group, old friends of yours, mm-hmm. work colleagues that aren't in the Champagne Boys, but are kind of honorary members. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, it's yeah. embarrassing to look bad. Yeah, but the thing about you, the, you're a lot of your work friends, all hunks. <laughs> you know, it's like John Populous, that guy's got a six pack. He works out yeah. a lot. He works out a lot. Uh, Chris Wong. He looks great. I've seen yeah. him with a cutoff shirt. Mark well, Myers, that guy's a model. Yeah, yeah. and you, you, yeah. you, how much do you weigh right now? No, no, no. no. You don't like talking about your weight now. No, no you're no. like a girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I probably lost maybe ten pounds. So how much do you weigh? Uh, I think like one, one seventy. Wow, one seventy. Wow, maybe one seventy. You're like six two. No, I'm barely six one. Oh my god. But Guess uh, how much I weigh. How much you weigh? Guess. <laughs> I'm humiliated. How much you weigh? Guess. Uh, I'm going to say 175. Mike? I'll go with I'll go with that. Oh, my God. How much you weigh? I weigh 195. Whoa. Oh my I am a fat f- pig. No. <laughs> I am. I swear to God. And Okay, so today I was, like, feeling really, like, you know how you can tell when you feel bad about your weight? Like, you're just like, oh, I'm a fat pig. So I, went, I thought you looked great. We just played basketball for our listeners, and oh my God. you came. You're wearing a, an Arkell shirt. Thanks a lot. And uh, Jr., our friend Jr. Dix, he, he complimented you to me. He said, "Have you been working out?" You, no, and I thought you looked great. F- humoring me because he's like, "You look bigger, man." Oh. He's like, "Have you been working out?" And then because I'm wearing a shirt that used to I kind of would swim in, but now it's like tight. <laughs> Okay. And you're just like, ah, it's just a tiny shirt. But the shirt's not that tiny. It, I'm just like, it, the Arkell shirts do get small in the wash. Yeah. And Mike's in a new home. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I went uh, up in your mirror. And you know how some mirrors you look good in and some sure. mirrors show you how you really look? Yeah. I took my shirt off in your- Just uh, now? It, no, uh, before we went to play basketball. Okay. To see how I looked in your mirror. I'm <laughs> disgusting looking. <laughs> it's disgusting. Like I've got like- Flab. Well, I feel like you're a pretty extreme guy, Shane. And I feel like in 10 days, you can do a lot of uh, turnaround That's what in I'm your thinking. body. Do you think it's possible to lose 20 pounds in 10 days? <laughs> I, it might be possible. I don't know if it's healthy. I'm willing to try. <laughs> no, I'm willing to find out. I well, feel like you've done this before. Like I feel like I've heard stories well, before I knew you where you'd go on these like extreme. You're an extreme yeah, person. I would go on wild rose cleanses, which you basically eat nothing. Uh-huh. But I was like, oh, it's probably like... I'm like, I don't look that bad. But then Mike and I were taking the train down okay. today. And, uh, you know, Mike, by the way, like we go in this zone. Where it's, what's it called? The quiet zone? The quiet zone, zone on, yes. the, on the go train. So I thought, Mike, I didn't bring my headphones because I didn't want to be rude. Uh, but Mike's like, oh, there's a quiet zone here. It's kind of taboo to talk. You're actually not allowed to talk in it. Yeah, people get very mad about that. Okay, yeah. so I was like, oh, I guess I'll just sit here and look at my phone. And then Mike falls asleep uh-huh. and his mouth is agape and he's kind of drooling a little bit. <laughs> and I'm like, I want to film him and put this on Snapchat. But Mike tends to go nuts at me for just like, Mike's very like even keeled, but some things he'll go nuts at. Uh-huh. And putting a bad picture of him on like Snapchat is one of the things he might be like, why the f- are you doing that? Yeah. Like he'll kind of snap at me. So I'm like, f- it. so I'm just looking at my phone with my eight chins down <laughs> and I'm like, oh, Snapchat, Mike Snapchatted on here. It's a fucking disgusting photo of me. What's the photo? It's looks fine. I'll saying sh- quiet zone. I look like a 58 year old man with a mustache and three chins. <laughs> <laughs> and it took You chose every- the mustache, by the way. I know. The mustache is cool. Just the eight chins okay. don't complement it well. <laughs> I'll sh- Max at, will be the judge. Max. This is I'll not be the a judge. I'll be the judge. Would Mike you be is pulling up the photo. photo. Uh-huh. Let's see here. Okay, I'm calling it up. Right That's now. why I control the Arkell's Instagram account. I exactly. You know what it's like. Stuff. Is that a bad photo? No, it's not he a bad looks photo. looks great. He looks oh, fine. He looks okay. good. You know what I would do? No, you look you look like yourself. What are you talking about? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> how, how many count? How many chins are there? Honestly, how many chins? There's literally... Uh, would you say there's one honestly, and a half chins? I didn't even notice one chin, and I'm looking at it closely. You, and you might not notice a jawline either. No, you look... We're going to post this. This is what we're going to do. We're going to post this on Mike's... Uh, sorry, on the Mike on Much Instagram account, and we can ask our followers, how many chins does oh Shane have? Oh, my God. How does that sound? <laughs> It's a nightmare. <laughs> anyway, I, I think you look like you always do. If I, for one second, thought you looked bad in that snap, I would never have sent it. I definitely yeah, I think you could have used a filter to sort of like, you know, the skin's a little blotchy, but. My skin's blotchy? <laughs> Just... I'm an acne riddled fatso? <laughs> oh my God. Dude, you look fine in this photo. I definitely fine. didn't think, if I thought you looked bad, I would never Alex, have posted do it. do I look good in this photo? Just quickly see it. Okay, so. I'm looking at it right now. There you go. 
She said you looked hot. Did she look hot? Okay. But it's all in your mind, man. Yeah. So you look great. You yeah. got you got like body dysmorphia or something. Mike and I were supposed to be in top shape. Uh-huh. Is it working out for you, Mike? Because I don't know what I'm doing wrong. No, I mean life gets busy. You had a bunch of shoots. Shane's been directing a bunch of commercials recently. Have you been boozing a lot lately? I tried not to booze for a month. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's the worst week of my life. <laughs> yeah. uh, what What else are you excited about the trip? Have you thought about more? Have you thought about the dynamic between bringing some of the champagne boys with the work friends? Has that been thought about? Uh, this is a question for both. It's of you guys. honestly been all weight obsession. Uh, <laughs> it, it truly has, and and not only for the bachelor party. That's only ninety percent of it. I also want to be thin for the wedding. Yeah, so uh, Shane's yeah. getting married in August. You have lots of time. Yeah, I yeah mean, and dude, yeah. you'll look great. You look suit great right now. By the way. I'm not wearing a suit, a Hawaiian. I'm wearing a Hawaiian shirt. Correct. I f-ing hate suits, too. But you, <laughs> you were in a Hawaiian shirt for the wedding? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I did the um, invites this weekend. That, oh, was my, that, that was supposed to be my big story. Okay, oh let's get to that. So yeah. I thought it would be smart to do a Facebook invite, invite. Sure. invite wedding. Yeah. Which I'm... Uh, I got it on Saturday night. Same yeah. piece. Yeah. That's exciting. And uh, you guys had a cute video on there. You guys made a video? You were wearing yeah, an Arkell like, sweater. <laughs> yeah, and I was drunk <laughs> in the video. But I, th- I thought it turned out well. We did like 20 takes. and uh, That was 20 takes. <laughs> yeah, that was the best. <laughs> the video, by the way, is like 11 seconds. They're like, hey, mm-hmm. we, we want you to, we're getting married. Do you think? We that, want you to come. That was it. It was like. It yeah, took two hours well, to write. We have, we have a motto. <laughs> We, we thought it was genius. We're like, let's make a motto for the wedding. Uh-huh. And the motto is, we. What? You. Two. Come. <laughs> it's we want you to come. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. It's supposed to be like a double entendre because our single <laughs> friends, we had a thing. We want them all to come single. Uh-huh. Like, no, we're not giving plus ones to our single friends. Oh, good. I like that. Is this, is to, this is to promote them hooking up. Yeah, it's like, we want you to come. Okay. We got that part. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> how, how lenient are you going to be with someone who gets a, because we talked about this on Saturday night, mm-hmm. with someone who gets a girlfriend, I don't know, three weeks before the thing. We talked about it in the Facebook group. Oh, that was, okay. So I, I didn't read all those. You didn't read it? No, I don't read all of them. Oh my God. It was very short, Max. That's <laughs> insulting. But <laughs> we, t- we have the a The Champagne Boys Facebook group. I can't believe you didn't read it. Well, there's a lot of messages in that Facebook group. I don't see every single one. It was an invite, though. Oh, the invite. invite. Oh, I got to read that. Sorry. (laughs) You you haven't even seen it? I've seen the invite, but it must have been added later. Do you think that's tacky to do a Facebook invite? No, it's the 21st century. Yeah, Yeah, I think. I I don't think anything's tacky anymore. Are you going to do that? No, we're going to send out invites. <laughs> right. Okay, But I don't think one's well, listen, better or worse than the other. I think it's different strokes for different folks. Yeah, and your whole wedding, it's like, let's let's go over this for listeners who la- who missed the previous episode. Uh, you're wearing a Hawaiian shirt. Yeah. What else? You've been dating for eight months, which is a little different. You're having, a, you, you said you got married or you proposed because you wanted to save money on them. No, I said that got the ball rolling. That got the ball rolling. Saving money on massages. Getting getting it opens a conversation on, thing. Sh- sure. So the Facebook invite totally makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Like that's your style with this whole wedding. Because I noticed my boss said maybe on the invite. Who? And I remember I had a flashback, I think, when we were drinking up at our boss's cottage when he was like, I hate and tacky weddings or something. So I'm like, maybe he said maybe because he thinks we're f***ing cheapos. He probably said maybe because he's having a baby. Oh, yeah, but he'll f***ing be front in line at your wedding. <laughs> 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 he's in the wedding party. Okay. So uh, that's it, you think? I, I just think that they with the baby, right around that time, they it's unknowable. So I wouldn't take okay. it personally. Yeah, and also... He did say you're putting on a few pounds. Of- <laughs> <laughs> Is Shane having a baby? <laughs> <laughs> Quadruplets, perhaps? <laughs> that's it. That's all. That's our episode. You can follow us at Mike on Much on Instagram and Twitter. We'd like to thank uh, Jenna Gregory, who does all the artwork for the show. She sure does. You can find her at Jenna's Doodles. Dot com. <laughs> dot com. Yeah. Um, shout out to Christina Fernandez, who works at Listen Harder uh, PR, and she helped uh, set us up with the Lumineers interview. And now when a, b- a big band like the Lumineers are in town, there's a lot of people vying for their attention. They only did a few interviews while they're in the building. And Christina, I think, put in a good word for, for the old Mike on Much podcast. So without Thank her, we wouldn't have got it. Thank you to Christina. Yeah. It's a big get. 
Yeah. Um, subscribe to the show on iTunes. Tell your friends. Leave a comment. We love uh, seeing you guys active on Twitter and Instagram and all that stuff. So, uh, yeah, thanks for all the love. The Mike and Watch Podcast is produced by Max Kerman, and I am your host, Mike Veerman. See you next week if we don't die on the weekend. <laughs>